Welcome again to uh, this week's uh, another colloquium this week. Uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Nick Pandatala here to, as our speaker. Uh, Nick received his uh, PhD from the University of Colorado in 2011 and uh, then he came here uh, to HEO as a, an ASP postdoc fellow. Uh, and after that in 2013 he joined the Cosmic Program Office as a project scientist. Uh, his research in interests include uh, uh, understanding the influence of lower atmospheric waves on the variability of the upper atmosphere uh, using both satellite observations and uh, numerical models, uh, development of uh, uh, application of data simulation techniques as a means to constrain the uh, numerical models, and uh, uh, more recently he has uh, been working on the, uh, improving the techniques for remote sensing for ionosphere using the global uh, navigation satellite uh, system observations. So today he's going to uh, discuss uh, uh, variability related to stratosphere uh, warming. All right. Thank you, Han Lee, and thank you everyone for coming and for a chance to present uh, some of work I've done over the past few years. So the overall science question uh, that we are trying to address here is really try to understand how forcing from the lower atmosphere via different uh, types of waves, be it either tidal, planetary, or gravity waves, and how they influence the ionosphere and thermosphere. And there are several different ways that uh, mechanisms that this can happen. I just uh, point out a few here. Uh, some are, say, earthquakes, uh, El Nino, topography, convection, instabilities, uh, stratosphere warming, QBO. So there are lots of different ways that processes in the lower atmosphere that can then you couple into variability in upper atmosphere. And in the upper atmosphere, the uh, response to these drivers are sort of equally diverse. Uh, you can create small-scale irregularities in the F region or sporadic E, and also variability over a uh, wide range of uh, spatial and temporal scales from sort of day-to-day -day variability to variability over several years' time period. And the sort of uh, question we want to answer is sort of what are the mechanisms that uh, are couple these two regions together and try to understand that. That's sort of the overall you know, perspective. But of course, this is quite a lot to include in a one hour presentation. <laughs> so we don't want to go into all that. Uh, here I will just talk about one aspect of this, which is the sudden stratosphere warming. Uh, but what we can learn from sudden stratosphere warming is in some ways applicable to, to other mechanisms that couple the various regions as well. Uh, so it's not necessarily just unique to sudden, sudden stratosphere warming. So just as brief uh, background so everyone is familiar with what we are talking with, uh, the sudden stratospheric warmings are dynamical uh, disturbances in the high latitude wintertime uh, stratosphere. Mesosphere and lower thermosphere is where you see the most uh, dynamical changes in the lower atmosphere. And they're characterized by uh, several key features, which I point out here. On the left shows a zonal mean temperature uh, at 70 degrees north in terms of altitude versus day. Uh, day is with respect to the center date of a stratosphere warming. And then the right hand is the anomaly from the stratosphere warming to prior to the stratosphere sudden warming. And the, the main characteristics you see in the lower atmosphere are obviously a, a warming of the stratosphere, which is you know, uh, intuitive from the name, which you see here in, in the stratosphere, you get a large increase in the temperature, then a, a cooling above in the mesosphere, and then in the lower thermosphere, you see a slight warming as well. And these processes occur over, you can see roughly uh, five to 10 days time period where you get this warming and then uh, cooling above. And uh, along with these temperature changes, you also get a change in the zonal mean, uh, zonal winds at, in the high latitude stratosphere and mesosphere. And this is a similar plot, but now instead of showing the zonal mean temperature, this shows the zonal mean zonal wind at 60 degrees north. And it's, again, altitude versus time. And you can see during the uh, stratosphere sudden warming time period, indicated by the zero date, you get a deceleration of the winds. And then even this is a case of a major stratosphere sudden warming. So the winds actually reverse direction in the stratosphere. And then in the mesosphere, you also get a reversal of the winds, but in the uh, opposite direction. 
And again, you can see the altitude versus latitude here, difference in the zonal mean winds uh, from the stratosphere warming to pre-stratosphere warming. And you can see that there's quite large perturbations here in the high latitude stratosphere and mesosphere. But uh, one important aspect here that you can see is these changes are really restricted uh, to the high latitude region. They don't propagate much uh, equatorward of about uh, 40 or 50 degrees in terms of the dynamical disturbances that we see in the stratosphere and mesosphere. So because these uh, changes are, are mostly occurring in the high latitude, it was quite a surprise uh, maybe seven or eight years ago to see that the equatorial ionosphere is actually quite perturbed uh, during stratosphere sudden warming time periods. Stratosphere warming. It's basically you get a planetary wave growth in the northern hemisphere uh, stratosphere, and those basically interact with mean flow that causes change in the winds. Uh, and that, that's why you generally only get them in northern hemisphere because there's much stronger planetary wave activity. And in southern hemisphere, they're very rare because the planetary wave activity is uh, much weaker. So you only see them in northern hemisphere, uh, except for rare cases in southern hemisphere winter. Uh, so um, as I was saying, it, it, because these changes, dynamical changes in the stratosphere and mesosphere are restricted to the high latitudes mainly, it, it was surprising to see that the equatorial ionosphere sees a, a quite large perturbations. This is a, a plot showing the change in the F region vertical plasma drift uh, observation at Hickamarca, Peru, which is at the geomagnetic equator. And this is now local time versus day. And the solid black line shows uh, uh, the stratosphere temperature. And you can see around the peak of stratosphere warming, you get these large perturbations in the uh, vertical plasma drift in the F region. And again, this is at the geomagnetic equator. And these changes are quite large, uh, 30 plus or minus 30 meter per second, which is roughly on the order of the drift. So you're seeing 50, 100% change in terms of the, the magnitude of the drift perturbation. So these are quite significant changes. And these changes in the equatorial vertical drift will also have uh, impact on the ionosphere electron densities by basically lifting the plasma up. And then as it diffuses down the geomagnetic field lines, it will affect the ionosphere anomaly region. And we can see that as well in the observations. This is a ground-based GPS total electron content. Uh, this is now latitude versus local time. This is the mean uh, climatology for January 2009. And then this is the perturbation in the total electron content right around the time of stratosphere sudden warming. And you can see that uh, these changes are quite large in the, that we see in the ground-based total electron content. If you compare the morning perturbations here compared to the climatological uh, average, you see roughly about 100% change in the total electron content. So these are quite large magnitude changes that we're seeing in the equatorial ionosphere, again, driven by these high latitude uh, changes in the stratosphere and mesosphere. And these changes that we see in the ionospheric electron densities, as I said, are consistent with the uh, plasma drifts. Now we see both of these plots uh, together. And if we look at when uh, the timing of the enhancement in the uh, vertical drifts in the morning here match quite nicely with the uh, perturbations in the ground-based total electron content, and also this, the decrease in the uh, evening time periods is also directly seen in the total electron content observation as well. So there's quite a clear um, coupling that we see in it throughout the ionosphere. But one of the questions is, since these perturbations are ex occurring at a low latitude, is try to understand what is really driving the, these changes in the ionosphere in terms of uh, the variability. And that is a sort of objective of the, the studies I will present here. And it, the really idea is to understand the numer use numerical simulations to understand the under fundamental mechanisms that are responsible for coupling the stratosphere sudden warmings to the upper atmosphere variability. And the primary hypothesis that has been uh, put forward uh, was that atmospheric tides are the 
there are changes in the atmospheric tides are the main source of the ionosphere variability. And the primary reason that this was thought to be the, the mechanism is that uh, previous numerical simulations showed quite clearly that the electrodynamics of the ionosphere are heavily influenced by the tides. This is a, a model simulation showing the vertical plasma drift at, uh, again, the same location in Peru. And the different lines here, uh, the, the heavy solid black line is the observation. And then the various uh, dotted and dashed line and the thin black line are different configurations of the atmospheric tides. And so it's quite clear that by changing the atmospheric tides, you can control the ionospheric drift. And then that would, in turn, influence the ionosphere of plasma density. So the hypothesis put forward would be that the atmospheric tides are the source of this variability that we see during sudden stratospheric warming. And that's what we want to investigate with these studies. Uh, but before uh, going into some of the simulations in more detail, just a brief uh, few words on the atmospheric tides, uh, since many people may not be too familiar. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but just make sure everyone has the same uh, understanding. So essentially, atmospheric tides are uh, a global scale periodic oscillations of the atmosphere that are generated by several different processes. The main processes are uh, periodic solar heating. Uh, so basically, you know, during the daylight hours, you're heating the atmosphere. And then at night, you're not. So you have the periodic solar heating. You also have gravitational forcing from the moon. Similar to the way that you would generate uh, ocean tides, you can also generate a lunar tide in the atmosphere. And then also latent heat release uh, due to tropical convection is also known to be a source of atmospheric tides. And uh, we typically refer to the tides as migrating if they propagate uh, westward with the motion of the sun and non-migrating if they're propagating either uh, faster or slower than the apparent solar motion. And uh, these, this has to do with how you would view the tide if you're at a fixed uh, solar local time. A, a migrating tide essentially moves with the sun and would appear uh, longitudinally invariant, whereas a non-migrating tide is, uh, invar is, displays a longitude variability at a fixed local time. And the, one of the key points here is that all of these tides are generated primarily in the troposphere and stratosphere. And then they propagate uh, upward. And as uh, they are propagating, they tend to grow in amplitude because of the decrease in uh, atmospheric density. And then roughly around 100 kilometers or so, the dissipation becomes large. And then the tides will dissipate. And that's around where they reach their largest amplitudes, which also happens to be the same altitude where you can generate efficient electric fields. So that's why the tides have such a strong control over the ionosphere uh, dynamo. And one other potential source of tides is this wave-wave uh, interaction, uh, where you have two tides or a tide and a, another wave, and they can interact uh, and generate additional secondary waves. So these are all just some background. And in terms of sudden stratospheric warmings, the main tides that we want to investigate, and I will discuss on the next slide why these are thought to be the primary drivers are the so-called semi-diurnal solar migrating tide, which we term SW2, the lunar uh, migrating tide, which is called M2, and then the westward propagating non-migrating semi-diurnal tide with zonal wave number one, which is SW1. And the reason that we think that these are the primary tides has to do with the structure of the variability that is observed in the ionosphere. So if we look at the, this plot again here that I have previously shown, which is the drift perturbations, if you look at the perturbations in terms of their structure and local time, so a slice this way, the perturbations that occur in the morning and in the afternoon are roughly six hours apart, which would be uh, characteristic of a semi-diurnal perturbation. So for that reason, it would suggest a, either semi-diurnal migrating tide or a non-migrating tide. One of the reasons we would expect perhaps a non-migrating tide is because one of the mechanisms that generate the stratosphere sudden warming, as, as uh, Stan asked, is this growth in planetary waves. So because you have a large planetary wave, it could interact with the tides, and that would create a, a non-migrating tide. So that is one reason we would expect these first two. And in terms of the lunar semi-diurnal migrating tide, uh, 
if you look at these perturbations, they tend to shift uh, slowly in local time towards a later hour. And if you're at a fixed uh, geographic longitude, the lunar phase basically could create this kind of shift in local time when you're at one observing location. So based on the observations, uh, you could hypothesize that these are the main mechanisms that may drive the variability. So what we want to address with the numerical simulations is to de first determine the tidal variability and if it matches our expectations that from this plot, and then by perform some experiments to see which of the, uh, these three mechanisms are perhaps the most important in terms of contributing to the equatorial ionosphere variability. And then I will also talk some about how they may influence, as well, the mid and high latitude ionosphere. So to do these uh, investigations, we use two models here uh, developed at, at NCAR. The first is the Wacom model, which is a whole atmosphere community climate model. And this model goes from the surface up to about 140 kilometers. It has all the chemical and dynamical variability necessary to simulate uh, both the solar-driven tides, planetary waves, all the interactions. And we have also added in the capability to do the lunar tide in Wacom so that we can investigate the effects of lunar tide on the uh, middle and upper atmosphere during sudden stratosphere warmings. And because Wacom only goes up to 140 kilometers, we cannot use that to investigate the ionosphere variability. Uh, so what we did was take Wacom and couple it with the time GCM model. Uh, so they overlap in a region of roughly 30 kilometers to 140. So we take the Wacom uh, zonal mean fields and basically use that to force the time GCM model to recreate what we are seeing in Wacom. And then we can look at the effects in the ionosphere and thermosphere. And we do this at the, in terms of the zonal mean fields up to about 95 kilometers, and then perform different experiments at the lower boundary of time GCM, which is about 30 kilometers, with different Wacom planetary waves and tides. And for the experiments I'm going to show, they're based on uh, a composite analysis of 13 sudden stratosphere warmings in Wacom that are just generated based on the free running Wacom. We just run the model, and it can self consistently uh, generate sudden stratospheric warmings. So we use those as a, a sort of baseline and then just put them together in a composite to create a sort of average picture of what a sudden stratospheric warming would look like in terms of both the zonal mean and also the tide and planetary wave perturbations. And then I will also show a few uh, more realistic simulations where the Wacom fields in the lower atmosphere are constrained based on a, a reanalysis field so that we can see how well the model is reproducing real observations, which always is a nice uh, check based on the sort of more idealized simulations to confirm that what we see in idealized simulations actually matches uh, the you know, real world. Um, so the way this is done, uh, in, in the following I will show, we basically did some controlled experiments where we have a sort of baseline run of uh, time GCM with all of the wave forcing included in the model lower boundary. So we hope that this can recreate the tidal variability. And then to look at some of the influence of the various waves from, say, the lunar tide, or if the planetary waves are creating this enhanced non-migrating tide, what we do is run a different, diff, different experiments where, say, for this first experiment, you might remove, say, the lunar tide and see how the system responds in that case relative to when you do include all the waves, or in another experiment where you, say, remove the planetary waves. So in this way, we can get a bit of uh, understanding of the sensitivity of the response in the atmosphere to the different wave forcing mechanisms. And so this is a very convenient way to do that. Uh, and first, in terms of the real simulation, this shows the tidal variability that we see in the uh, mesosphere, low and thermosphere region. This is 120 kilometers. Uh, this is the case where we include all the forcing mechanisms during the stratosphere warming. So zero is a sort of central date of the warming. And you can see uh, the top is a migrating semidernal tide. Then this is the non-migrating semidernal tide. And then this is a lunar tide. And you can see during the stratosphere of southern warming, all three enhance right around the time of the warming. So in some sense, 
all of them could be creating you know, some of this variability in the ionosphere. Uh, so by performing these sort of uh, denial experiments where we remove some of them, we are able to assess the relative impact of these different tides on the ionosphere variability during sudden stratospheric warming. But one question also is that you could ask of why these waves are being enhanced during the sudden stratospheric warming. And the main reason we see enhancement is uh, the semi-diurnal migrating tide and solar and lunar tides are primarily due to change in the mean winds. And I will show these on the next slide. And then I will present evidence from our model simulation as to why the, we get this uh, non-migrating semi-diurnal tide variability and how it is related to the interaction with the planetary waves. So in terms of the uh, semi-diurnal migrating solar tide, uh, this plot here uh, is from a paper by a Japanese group using their whole atmosphere model. And this plot shows the source of the symmetric mode of the semi-diurnal tide based on a li linearization of the equations for the tides. And it, but it accounts for basically changes in the zonal mean winds during the stratosphere sudden warming. And you can see right at time of stratosphere sudden warming, which is indicated by dashed line, you get very strong enhancement in the semi-diurnal tide, the source from this. And if you look at the um, terms in the equation, basically what you're getting is a shift in terms of the relative uh, symmetry versus asymmetry of the zonal mean winds. And that leads to this large enhancement of the symmetric mode of the semi-diurnal tide during the sudden stratospheric warming. So these shifts in the winds that I discussed in the early part of the presentation basically create this enhancement in the tide uh, during the sudden stratospheric warming. And this is for the solar tide. And for the lunar tide, it's a, a similar situation, but perhaps slightly different mechanism. Um, and this plot here shows the, uh, basically, you can think of it as a somewhat of a response uh, spectra for different oscillation periods based on the zonal mean background. And the, uh, as sort of background, there are certain resonant or normal modes of the atmosphere uh, that come about. And one of these happens to be out here around uh, 12 and a half hours uh, normally. And this is the dashed line shows before stratosphere sudden warmings, and the solid is during sudden stratospheric warming. So these wind changes are essentially shifting uh, where you would get a resonant uh, frequency of the atmosphere. And it just so happens that this shift uh, creates uh, a peak right at the lunar tide period. So in this case, you're basically shifting the mean winds towards an a instance where you would get a, a resonant peak at the same period that you're basically forcing from the lunar period. So in that, for that reason, you would expect to see it, uh, this large enhancement in the uh, migrating lunar uh, tide. So that explains those two. And in terms of the question of the non-migrating semi-diurnal tide, as I mentioned, this is, was thought to be generated due to the enhanced uh, planetary wave activity that you get prior to a sudden stratospheric warming. It is one of the main producers of the warming. And this is, um, as I mentioned, we perform these sort of e experiments with the model. And so the plot on the left, upper left, is latitude versus day. And this is with the planetary waves in the simulation. And if we take away the planetary waves at the model lower boundary, we get something that looks like this. And you can see this large enhancement right before the stratosphere sudden warming uh, is no longer present when we remove the planetary waves. So this suggests that. Uh, we get this enhancement in this uh, non-migrating tide during the sudden stratospheric warming because of these large planetary wave amplitudes prior to the warming. And you can see, if you look at the planetary wave amplitude, this is in the model at the lower boundary at, in the northern hemisphere. Right around the time you get the peak of the planetary wave activity, you get this enhancement. And afterwards, as it decays, the tide is much weaker. So this is, yes. Um, in this case, we're forcing the warming with the mean winds. So the warming is sort of imposed based on the mean winds. Um, it, so because we're not really self-generating the warming in this case in time GCM. Uh, 
So this is from time GCM. We, you can't remove the planetary wave from uh, Wacom. So this is sort of a perhaps a semi-unrealistic experiment. <laughs> uh, but it does assess whether this tidal mode is, is being driven by this uh, nonlinear interaction. So the question then becomes, since we know that all three of these waves were you know, hypothesized as um, being important for the ionospheric response, and from the simulation they're all enhanced, the question is perhaps which is, how do they actually affect the ionosphere in terms of each of the individual components? Uh, so we looked at the different simulations then to try to investigate this. And now th these plots show the change in the vertical plasma drift velocity at uh, Hickamarker, Peru, so same location as I have been showing. And these are simulations all done without any lunar tide. So we have removed that part of the question. And the top plot shows with planetary waves and tides. And you can see around the warming, we get uh, some perturbations in the evening and in the morning. And then the bottom plot shows if we remove the planetary waves. So in this case, we only really have the variability due to the migrating semi-diurnal semi solar tide. And in this case, you can see there is variability where we get in the evening. And there is some, even this propagation towards later local time. Uh, and that, this change here is uh, believed to be due to there is a slight phase shift in the tide as well. And that could generate this. But so from these plots here, uh, you can see that, one, both uh, the semi-dernal solar tide and the non-migrating tide can both have some contribution to the ionosphere variability during the sudden stratosphere warming. But it seems to be mostly driven by this uh, migrating solar tide, since we get similar perturbations between these two. This is perhaps the, the main source between these two. But then the question is, what is the impact of the lunar tide? So if we add that into simulation, uh, we get these plots. Now these here are the contribution to the vertical drift. So these are perturbations on top of perturbations, I guess, uh, which is slightly confusing. But you can think of uh, the contribution of lunar tide is this plus uh, what you would see here. So you, you're basically looking at perturbations. And that's only to make the contribution of lunar tide slightly clearer. Um, and so the, the different plots here are all showing the same thing of local time versus day. But the different panels show basically changing the phase of the moon relative to the center day of the stratosphere sudden warming. So uh, the, uh, in this case, the new moon is on day zero. In this case, it's on uh, day minus seven. This, and on these two places, it's plus or minus 3.5. And you can see that by basically changing the lunar period, uh, or lunar phase, relative to the sudden stratospheric warming, you actually do change the response. Uh, so in this case, you get a decrease here around day five. And in here, you would get increase. So the sort of net response you would see in ionosphere is actually sensitive to the phase of the moon relative to when the stratosphere sudden warming occurs. And if we look at these perturbations, you can see they're on the order of uh, roughly 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Uh, and that's roughly about 30% of the contribution we would see from just the solar tides on the previous plot. Uh, so the, there is some impact from the lunar tide of around 30%, but there is also a contribution from the other uh, tides as well. So I, I think in, in some sense, the answer to the question of which of the tides are most important is that any single one of them is not really the most important. It's really they're all combined together, creating the net response. And you can't necessarily just say it's one tide that is the main, or one tide drives all the ionosphere response. It's really a combination of a, several different that combine to create the final response. And as I mentioned, these are all the free-running simulations. So you could ask, you know, we see some contribution from lunar tide, or whether or not these are actually important uh, contributions. And so to look at that, we did realistic simulations where we constrained the model based on a realistic time period. And this is showing example for the 2009 sudden stratosphere warming. And this is the observations. This is the same observations that I have shown previously from Hickamarker, Peru, just different uh, color scale. Uh, 
for easier comparison. And then these are the two model simulations we did, one without the lunar tide, which is this panel, and then one with, which is the top panel. And you can see if we don't include the lunar tide in our simulations, we do create something that looks like a sudden stratospheric warming. You get this, some enhancement. It sort of propagates toward later local time and a decrease in the evening. But if we do include the lunar tide in the simulation in the top plot, we get a much better match with the observation in terms of this sort of temporal shift. So I think this suggests from the, the, what we see in the free running sort of experiments is actually consistent with what you see in, the, in a real case of this uh, 2009 and in agreement with the observation. And this is not only true looking at this one location of Hickamarca. This shows a more global picture. This is the zonal mean uh, ionosphere F region peak height. At, uh, this is at 18 local time. This is, again, top panel with the lunar tide, middle panel without, and then the bottom panel is observation from cosmic satellite. And you can see in terms of these sort of variability in the, these sort of peaks and this decrease here, when we have the lunar tide, we get much better agreement with the observation than in the simulation without. So this would suggest that the um, perturbations that we see uh, in the free running simulation are in better agreement if we do include the lunar tide. So again, all of these waves are uh, contributing to ionosphere response. And another um, question is, that is how these tides, in addition to Im influencing the equatorial ionosphere, is how this large increase in the tides might have a more global impact on the ionosphere and thermosphere. And that is the second question we want to uh, address with our uh, studies. And this plot here shows uh, the percentage change in the uh, uh, thermosphere O to N2 ratio due to migrating diurnal and semi-diurnal tides. And you can see there is essentially globally we get a decrease in the thermosphere composition uh, uh, that extends into F region. And these changes would have a direct impact on the ionosphere electron densities uh, through in influencing production and loss. And as I said, this is the country, this is uh, the change that you get by basically having tides in your simulation or not having tides. And these result due to changes in the circulation due to the dissipation of tides. But these uh, simulations, such as the result shown here and others, basically focus on a very idealized case where you have a tide, uh, you just turn it on and let it go, or you turn it off and look at the differences over a certain time period. But the question is, during sudden stratosphere warming, when you have this short period enhancement of, say, 5 to 10 days enhancement in the tides, does that create this large circulation change and then create a, a large variability in the sort of mean sense of the thermosphere and ionosphere due to the changes in the circulation driven by the dissipating tides? So we wanted to look at this with the time GCM and TIE GCM simulations to see if these tides are basically driving uh, a global reduction in the ionosphere and thermosphere uh, composition and densities. Uh, so this plot here shows the time GCM results. Uh, initially, just to sort of demonstrate this, this is a zonal and diurnal mean NMF2 on the plot, on, on the top plot. And the dashed line indicates the timing of the sudden stratospheric warming in this case. And you can see after the warming, there is this large decrease, not only in equatorial region, but you can see at the mid to high latitudes in southern hemisphere and in northern hemisphere, we see this reduction in the ionosphere NMF2. And also, if we look at the O to N2 ratio, this is at the, in the F region of the altitudes, so in the sort of middle thermosphere. Uh, this is, again, the zonal and diurnal mean, but you can see after sudden stratospheric warming, there's this reduction in the composition, uh, both in equatorial region, but also extending at to mid to high latitudes we see here. Uh, if you, it's a little bit easier to see if you just look across at one latitude. You can quite clearly see the decrease you would get at that location. And, it, and if we look at the tides, at, in this case, this is a zonal uh, wind semi migrating solar tide. 
you can see that these decreases in the ionosphere and thermosphere are coincident with these changes in the tides. So the, the question is, is this tide, basically the dissipation of this tide and this uh, enhancement creating a, a change in the global circulation that then creates these decreases in the ionosphere and thermosphere, essentially uh, on a much larger scale than we saw in just the equatorial region. And so to do that, instead of using the time GCM model, we uh, bring in another model, uh, which is a TIE GCM, which is similar to time GCM, but its lower boundary is at 97 kilometers instead of 30. And the reason for using uh, TIE GCM for these experiments that I will present is essentially because it's a little bit easier to just remove the tide because it's closer to its peak altitude. It's, it would be very difficult to remove the semi uh migrating solar tide from time GCM uh, because it is partly generated by ozone, which is included in time GCM. So we can't really just remove it. But in TIE GCM, it's a little bit easier to remove some of the tides right at the lower boundary. So here is comparison of the two. This is time GCM, the same plots I show on the previous slide on the left, and then TIE GCM on the right. And you can see the sort of general features in terms of this decrease around the stratosphere warming that we see in the uh, ionosphere NMF2 and in the thermosphere composition are generally well reproduced in TIE GCM if we include all of the uh, fields from time GCM at the TIE GCM lower boundary. So based on this, we have some confidence that you can use, uh, do some experiments in TIE GCM to investigate the impact of the tides. The main difference is we see a little bit at high latitudes. And this could be some influence because there's a gravity wave drag in time GCM that could still be having some impact uh, that is not included in TIE GCM. And also, any changes in the composition that would occur in the mesosphere are neglected in the, the TIE GCM. Uh, so if there's a change in the atomic oxygen around uh, 97 kilometers that we would see in time GCM, this is not included in the TIE GCM simulation. But I think that this, the comparison here is good enough that we can at least have some confidence that in TIE GCM we can look at the uh, responses and get a, a reasonable sense. So we take the TIE GCM and then remove the semi diurnal tide to see if the dissipation of that is what is creating these changes in the mean ionosphere and thermosphere composition. And that is shown on the, the left-hand plots here, show the result if you basically just filter out the semi diurnal solar migrating tide uh, from the lower boundary of the TIE GCM and include all the other uh, fields. And here you can see there is some hint of a decrease in the sort of equatorial region. But if you look at the mid to high latitudes, you no longer see this decrease in the uh, NMF2 and similar in the O to N2 uh, ratio. So that would suggest that a lot of this is being driven by a change. The, the tidal dissipation is, is creating this change here. Uh, but there's still a little bit left. But if you remove also the planetary waves at the lower boundary of the model, uh, then you basically just see this longer term change is a seasonal change. Uh, and in this case, you see none of this perturbation. So the conclusion here would be that it's primarily this increase in the semi diurnal tide that creates a, a change in the circulation. And then that basically influences the entire ionosphere and thermosphere at higher altitudes. And that is shown a, a bit clearer here. This is the change in the zonal mean circulation due to the semi diurnal tide and planetary waves during the stratosphere southern warming. And you can see here the circulation, basically, this at the, in mostly equatorial region, you get this uplifting here, which will create a decrease in the atomic oxygen. And then at higher latitudes, this downwelling would create increase. And if we look here, this is in the uh, uh, roughly around 120 kilometers. This is latitude versus time. This is the change in the atomic oxygen. Uh, from the simulation with all of the tides compared to the simulation without the tides, without the semi-diurnal tide and planetary waves. And you can see this decrease in the equatorial region where you get the, where there's primarily this upwelling. And then at the higher latitudes where you have more of the downwelling, you get this uh, the increase. 
And then these changes that are occurring below about the 120, 130 kilometers will propagate upwards into the thermosphere due to diffusion. And we can see here, this is at, uh, in the thermosphere, the change in atomic oxygen you see very similar to what we see in the in lower thermosphere, this decrease in equatorial region and the uh, increase here. So this would suggest that these changes in circulation that drives this then propagates the higher altitude. Uh, and that is what's responsible for these changes in the thermosphere uh, composition, which then in turn drive the ionosphere uh, variability. And then to test whether this is the mechanism that is really creating it, uh, what I did was take the zonal mean circulation in the lower thermosphere from the case that included all of the various tides. So this is the zonal mean circulation that recreated this decrease. And then put in that circulation, but removed the semidiurnal tide. So in this case, you just have the circulation change in the lower part of the thermosphere. And then that is simulation here on the left. And then the simulation I previously shown here is on the right. And you can see in this case on the left, when we just replace the zonal mean circulation in the lower thermosphere, uh, you do recreate these decreases at mid-latitudes in the uh, ionosphere and also in the thermosphere composition. It's slightly different in equatorial region, which may suggest that there may be some influence on the ties changing the electrodynamics in sort of equa equatorial region, you could have some changes. But if we look at the mid latitudes it see and compare these two plots, it would suggest that just by changing the mean circulation in the lower thermosphere uh, due to the tides, you're getting this sort of change in the, throughout the thermosphere and ionosphere, uh, at quite an extended latitude range that we see these uh, perturbations during the stratosphere sudden warming time periods. So just um, that is a brief summary and conclusions. Uh, I think that the sudden stratospheric warmings, uh, they provide a rather ideal scenario for studying the different coupling processes uh, in, that couple the lower and upper atmosphere. Uh, and we can learn a lot from the sudden stratospheric warmings, but I think a lot of that is also potentially applic applicable to other cases of different um, mechanisms that you have this coupling. Uh, and by performing some controlled numerical simulations, we demonstrate that the changes in the semidernal migrating solar and lunar tides are the primary source of the equatorial ionosphere variability. But there is also some contribution from non-migrating semidernal tides. And in the end, the, the true variability that you get is really a combination of all three of them. So sort of isolating one and saying that is the source of variability is um, perhaps oversimplifying the case. And it's really some combination of everything. Uh, and it is the mean winds that drive these changes in the tides. And a, another key point is that the, this enhancement that it occurs in the tides, it modifies the global circulation in the lower thermosphere. And then this basically leads to a decrease in the zonal and diurnal mean ionosphere and thermosphere. It, it has an effect all the way out to mid and high latitudes, uh, which is a rather large effect and I think uh, demonstrates a sort of global impact of the, uh, of the sudden stratospheric warmings uh, on the upper atmosphere. And I think despite some of this progress, um, there's still uh, several open questions. One is um, how representative are sudden stratospheric warmings of other periods when you have enhanced planetary wave activity? Uh, there are other times of the year when you may have very strong planetary wave activity. And whether or not they exhibit the same uh, features as the sudden stratospheric warming in terms of ionosphere and thermosphere variability is not uh, in entirely clear at the moment. And then another question is whether uh, using data assimilation, we can get better uh, simulations of the upper atmosphere response in terms of realistic simulations of the sudden stratospheric warmings, which I think can give you a lot of insight into things like changes in composition, because it, we don't have as good necessarily observations. So we may be able to infer 
the changes uh, that we see elsewhere. So that would be useful. And, uh, and even though I said that the simulations do an OK job of reproducing observations, I think if you look closely, you can see that there's still quite a lot of dis discrepancy between the observation and simulation. Um, and the final point, uh, which I think I would like to conclude on, is it's important, I think, uh, in terms of trying to understand how these lower atmosphere influences dictate the upper atmosphere response to geomagnetic storms. And um, this, I think, points one of the importance of understanding the lower atmosphere effect. And to demonstrate uh, the importance of this, this is just a simple uh, example that I think will hope to demonstrate why we need to investigate this. Uh, this is a, a model sort of idealized simulation. This is a, on the left, shows a zonal mean, zonal wind. So stratosphere sudden warming occurs here. And at the same time of stratosphere sudden warming in the model, put in a very large geomagnetic storm of Kp equal to 9, right at the peak of the warming, to look at do you have different effect. And then this plot here on the right shows a zonal and diurnal mean NMF2 in equatorial region. And the dashed green is the sudden stratospheric warming only. So you can see it's not very variable, but there's this decrease. Then the solid black is a, a storm case. And you can see from here to here, there's roughly 100% change in the density. Uh, in, and then if you add in the sudden stratospheric warming, now the change is only 80%. Uh, so there's roughly 20% difference in the storm time response, whether or not you account for the lower atmosphere driving. Uh, so I think trying to understand how these all combine together is very uh, important, remaining open question. Uh, and I think also points to the uh, critical nature of understanding this lower atmosphere variability in terms of really understanding the, the total upper atmosphere variability. It shows that you cannot necessarily neglect this uh, during geomagnetic storm time periods. Uh, it's kind of, this is actually, uh, this is October 2003. <laughs> I just shifted in time. <laughs> So this is Halloween storm right here. Uh, and this, this difference here is basically difference in uh, F107, kind of pre-storm. Uh, I did this kind of very quick. And there's not much analysis here. Just sort of experiment to see if uh, you know, the lower atmosphere does actually have a impact on the upper atmosphere response. And I think in this sort of one quick ex idealized experiment, it does demonstrate that it should not be neglected uh, in all cases. Uh, so with that, I will conclude and happy to take any questions. Questions for Nick? I have a quick, oh. So the, uh, the test that you showed where you um, turned off the tides, but retained the um, zonal mean circulation associated with the stratospheric warming that was actually produced by the tides. You got a similar type of effect, but it appeared that the amplitude was, uh, it was hard to judge from your comparison. It looked to me like it was maybe half. Yes, it, it is a bit weaker. And uh, so my question is, uh, what might account for the remainder. I, I know, for example, that Mac Jones is looking at a, a different mechanism of might, what might affect this. Yeah, there it. could be uh, either a different mechanism. There, there is some thought that you know this lifting or lowering the, due to the tides could contribute. Um, so that could be one possibility. The other, in this case, I only put over a certain small region. So I'm not sure how much. I did not experiment with the depth of changing the circulation and how much that impacts. Um, so there could be some, you know, if, if, you, if I did not change over enough depth, maybe you're not getting everything. Um, so, so you should have the, the uh, t tidal variability can, can have a global effect on the composition, on the atomic to molecular composition. Um, uh, especially, I 
presumably most of that's happening in the, in the changes in the atomic oxygen, but, the, but not only a redistribution, but a global average change in that composition. So, so where does the atomic oxygen go if, if there's a global average shift due to the, these tidal motions? Well, I don't think it's a total decrease. It may be partly just a redistribution. Well, in you, this show, you show one plot. I guess it wasn't actually your plot. It was, it was Yamazuki's plot. But you know, it had, it, some areas went down more than others. But 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 the the the, the, uh, the minimum change. Well, you, you might go back up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, the the minimum change was like zero, and then. Mm -hmm. and, and then you mentioned that that the global yeah there you go yeah everything is down except for a few places where it's even so there's a global decrease in in this composition ratio so so that makes me wonder where it went Gonchurenko had looked at this tidal response to sudden warmings and was speculating that it was because of ozone changes. Did, did that have any effect on what you were doing? Um, there is some thought that it is due to the ozone change. But it, I think my, so my understanding is that the ozone change would probably not be significant enough. And in, um, that is somewhat supported by some of the other simulations. For example, the, the Gaia, the Japanese model, they simulate um, quite large changes in the tides, and they use a climatological ozone field for you know, January average. So I think by those simulations, that if you have climatological ozone, but you're changing the mean and you get this large tidal response, that would essentially disprove the mechanism that it's due to a change in the ozone. Actually, related to that, uh, you showed a picture by Jin et al. using Gaia model. And uh, and uh, the SW2, it seems uh, it was, you know, there's a red spot, a very large increase, but only kind of confined. The increase is mainly confined to the uh, stratosphere. It doesn't seem to extend oh, very much higher. That was the source, so that that was not the actual tidal enhancement. The tidal enhancement actually extends higher. Uh -huh. I think what that that plot is showing is where the change in the mean winds was having the most impact. Oh, okay. In terms of, the so that plot is not amplitude. It's no, not total no. amplitude. I should. That is the that source. Okay. Uh, just to clear up issues with uh, this all being negative, if you decrease the temperature everywhere, it will be negative everywhere. Um, it's just the basic physics. P equals rho. Rho R T does that. Net temperature change. Questions? Uh, I have another question. So, so the uh, uh, you showed the comparison between the model and uh, observ I think it's observations uh, uh, of the um, either drift or uh, electron density. And uh, I remember uh, seems that the model, the EIA structure is has a very short distance uh, latitudinally, while the observation has a much wider distance. Is that just for the SSW, or is it a general feature for TGCM? Uh, I think that's a general feature of okay. the model, is that the anomalies tend to be too narrow compared to the observation. OK. No more questions? Oh, let's uh, thank uh, Nick again. Thank you very much.